look, I can't hear you very well. Well, then turn me up. If you really wanna <laughs> make the change, wait to go again. Cut yourself off. Cut it off. Wait, what the fuck? Uh, I'm actually not synced anymore, John. What the fuck? Are you connected to the Wi-Fi or what? The DL32R, right? Yeah. Are you connected to the Wi-Fi though? Yeah. Rip Zipper Five. Yeah. Rip Zipper. Okay. You going to devices on the app? <laughs> what are you eating? I'm eating tacos, bro. <laughs> it's funnier because I can't see you. I like that I can only hear it. Yeah. I heard you can only buy them. Oh, on, dude, uh... get that taco grease off my phone. You sick fuck. Here, just tell me what to do. I, you, I can tell there's grease. The fact that you're only using a pinky is all I need to know. Oh my god. car seat headrest stuff was more loop based more improvisational after the numbered albums i kind of got out of that and went back towards a rock style and then i think twin fantasy is really where you know the first really good car seat headrest album that i made basically was okay yeah. right there there they are that's really weird yeah i never really think about that cuz like i can always hear the drums you betcha <laughs> But I, I didn't even think about that. Like, there's probably some shows you play where you just can't hear the bass at all, yeah. right? Well, I always can tell when you can't hear things too, because it's like I, I make an effort to make sure we're gonna come in at the same time, because I can tell that like, in the mess of the room and with your yeah. monitors, you just can't hear there's what been, beat I'm playing on guitar. You know? Yeah. There's been times where I have completely lost all sound. Yeah. It's just a wall of. Mm -hmm like broken monitor situation or just really bad monitor situation. And that's when I just have to watch these guys. When you are playing on stage, like what role do you kind of tend towards? Are you more reacting to the audience? Are you kind of front manning it? Or are you watching the band? And if so, are you watching someone in particular in the band? And like, how are you keeping things going basically? So maybe we'll do yeah, that one by one again. Oh, we'll start tough. on this side. I'm just trying to keep the flow of my own short attention span thing going because I've always got this thing where like if I stand still for too long I get really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Like the only way I can not feel nervous on stage is to just be always doing shit. And that's so it's not really reacting to the crowd so much as just like, oh I gotta do that thing and I gotta, yeah, I gotta try that city. idea, yeah, this idea, and do all these probably a better front man than me. Seth, what do you go off of? Um, mostly the band, honestly. Like, if I could 
Ignore the audience I would. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like that's kind of like inducive to like bass playing in general because you're kind of like the glue of like yeah, the rhythm section injured. and like the harmonies. When you're in Australia, some of the shows like festivals, like I would get a lot of those, hey, you, you know, like <clears throat> nice. Like, yeah. And then I'm always like, yeah. So then I was riding off that and we played in Melbourne and there were so many car seat, like diehard car seat fans that everyone was staring at you. And the more that everyone did that, the more I acted out to distract them <laughs> from you. Really mostly, as long as I can play my part, I try to like move kind of like Ethan does, where it's like if I feel like if, I, if I'm stagnant, then I'm not giving enough energy. And like I may as well move and uh, feel like I'm being entertaining. And if I feel like I'm entertaining and I'm playing a part well, I have a good time. Growing up, I wanted to be a, a drummer with the stage presence of Freddie Mercury. I wish during car seat I could play the bongos while running back and forth across the stage. <laughs> I wish sure we could have that. Yeah, that would be a, awesome. A pack for we it. gotta set I've, that up. Yeah. Like, so I've had my own like solo project thing for a while, but I always loved the idea of like being able to make a completely new one that's like a different aesthetic and a different vibe, mm -hmm. and then releasing that under a different name, even though it's you know, the same idea, right? but I was just curious if you had ever, like, had anything like that. Yeah. I Whereas, mean, like, I Car Seat, like... it's like this stuff, and then... Well, I think Car Seat kind of started out like that, because before Car Seat, I had another solo project called Nervous Young Men, oh. and I put out four or five records in high school under that name on Bandcamp, and then no one was... I was trying to get my friends to listen to it, and just random people at school to listen to it, and no one is really going for it. So I figured I would kind of turn and do something more anonymous, more experimental, and just po post it online and basically not share it with anyone and see if anyone picked up on it. And I started doing that, and I did four albums in four months. And those were the numbered Jesus. albums. <laughs> well, I mean, it's just like literally, you know, I sit down and finish a song in one sitting. Oh, yeah. It was not good material, but it was just kind of the raw. Those are the good old days, though. Yeah, those are the good old days when I back when I could do that. Wait, so did anybody pick them up? Well, very slowly. I mean, it was one, two, three, four, and then five turned into "My Back Is Killing Me, Baby." I retitled it and switched up some songs, and then "Twin Fantasy," and then by the time we were on Twin Fantasy, or I was on Twin Fantasy, there were definitely people listening, probably like a hundred people bought that record when it came out, or downloaded it. Um, yeah. But that was 2011, and I started Carsey Address in 2010, so it was a year of putting stuff up online to get to that point. Shit.
your ex invented So let's meet up in Uncanny Valley You never hit the door Three of us always talk about how, like, you know, when we were young tots, we saw videos of, like, The Who and Led Zeppelin. And we were like, wow, that's really cool. Like, what if we could do that, you know? Yeah, we always wanted to be famous. So. <laughs> <laughs> I did, I did, I was yeah, a kid. Then... I thought my life would mean nothing if I wasn't famous. I feel like we probably all felt like that at some point. Definitely never felt like my life would be nothing if I wasn't famous. <laughs> I think you could have a really good life and not be famous. I mean, did you want to be famous? No, I never I never wanted to be famous. What I did always dream about was playing on a big ass stage in front of a lot of people. Isn't that not, the same did, thing? Don't, I don't necessarily have to be like, known. Uh, okay. I don't necessarily have to be known. I'm a drummer. I sit in the fucking back. It's dark, you know, there's dark so lights. It's more about seeing the crowd. For it's you. it's more like me doing something and seeing like a thousand people do something else because I just did something. Uh, okay. You know? Well That's so isn't, the feeling. isn't fame kind of like that, but on a like on a different scale, you know? Like you putting it's, it's something similar. out and people reacting to sure. it on the internet. But but fame, you have to be known. Like in my dream scenario, no one has a fucking clue ah, I see. who I am. They just hear the Honestly, sound. I, I think I can get behind that. Yeah. Like for me, it's like, I, I definitely, you know, I grew up wanting my music to be known. But I think that that was it for me where it's like, it's more important to me that my music is popular than that like I am a celebrity. And so that's weird ground to tread because these days I feel like it's a lot harder to get music to a certain point without becoming like a personality behind it. Um, so instead you have to do things like shooting yourself uh, in a garage talking about your feelings. <laughs> um, when you're jamming, like what do you do to try to make it a good jam basically or what are signs of a bad jam on the other hand a bad jam is where like everybody starts out on one idea and they don't have enough telepathic communication to be able to trans uh like to to be able to go to another idea and all make the transition without like missing it but yeah that's why that's what makes performance special is because like in addition, it's like it's like jamming, but on a bigger level where you're also jamming with the audience and like right. jamming with the space around you. Right. And that's why it can go so wrong because you can get into bad headspace and that just kind of like spreads. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, that's the beauty of a performance. Yeah, I mean, I just I think live performances have to be live in some way. Like that's what separates a good show from a, a bad show for me is like is there something happening in that moment that is never gonna happen again in quite the same way? Um, you know, so a band that just gets up there and plays to backing tracks, that still can be a good performance if they're doing something that is unique each time they're on stage. Um, or a band can be playing completely live on, you know, all their own instruments, but if they're doing the same thing every night and keeping to the same beats, it's not gonna be interesting. Um, maybe, well, maybe that's like more than the risk thing. Like, we enjoy being reminded of impermanence. Yeah, you know what I mean. For sure. And like being reminded that, like, oh, each moment that we live can only happen once. Like, that's special. That's beautiful. Yeah, like, that's what life is, right? Yeah, I think, and that's, I think that's sort of at the heart of music, and that's why people. I don't know if people really know like what they want from concerts nowadays, which makes it difficult as a performer. But I do think that, you know, on an un unconscious level at least, that's what they want is some sort of experience that they can't get any other way at any other time. And um, so I kind of try and 
you know, time our sets so we're doing something different every time we come through a city. Mm -hmm. So if someone catches it twice, they're not going to catch the same set twice. And hopefully that, I mean, that leads to some frustration for me as far as people aren't always going to get the songs they expect to hear and it's not going to sound the same as it does on the record. Because I mean, the benefit of a record to me is that you put it together in exactly the way you want and then that's it. It stays that way. And then the benefit of a live performance is the opposite. You can keep changing it and it evolves night by night. And, um, you know, anyone in the audience who's willing to go along with that ride, I think is going to have a good time at our shows. I think there's definitely some importance in doing bullshit too. I think that's laying the groundwork for some important music. And um, I think I'm definitely going to be in a bullshit phase from here on out. Uh, <laughs> gonna be making a lot of bullshit in the next year and then see where see where that goes.